From Microbe TV, this is Tuivo, This Week in Evolution, episode number eight, recorded on May 10th, 2016. This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,400 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99. That's $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello. And you are listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today, right here in New York City, Nels LD. Hey, Vincent. Great to be here in vivo. You're right next to me. Yeah. You're not in Salt Lake. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. I escaped to the East Coast here. And I have to say, it's wonderful to be here. I feel like a kid in a science podcasting candy store. You think there are a lot of podcasting equipment? Type things here is that right? <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, taking notes here for the more um, uh, primitive LD Lab studios that could we could use a little shot in the arm compared to the horsepower I'm seeing in front of me. Well, this took you know eight years to, uh, <laughs> to evolve to this point. Now, as I started with uh, two mics and a tiny recorder, uh, and I just wanted to get better and I improved. So this is where we are. And I, you know, people always ask me, "How did you learn this?" And I said, "I'm a scientist. I can learn anything." Yeah, there you go. You feel that way, Nels? Well, I don't know about everything, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> but I do know that um, you know now that Tuivo has a sponsor, that this is feeling like we're going in sort of a professional direction ourselves. I just signed an ad deal. Yep, to get some sponsorships for the Microbe TV uh, series of science shows. Cool. And so for the months of May, June, and July, we're going to be talking about Curiosity Stream, and I'll have more to say about them. Uh, in a bit, but uh, hopefully there'll be the start and we can support things like me visiting you, you yeah. know, and, uh, or other places or us going somewhere. Absolutely. And that would be fun because, you know, while it's great to do podcasts, uh, by Skype every now and then it's cool to do some in person. So. No question. Makes a big difference. And I'm thrilled to be here today with you. This is really fun. So you're okay leaving uh, Salt Lake? You don't yep. have any uh, withdrawal problems? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> got out okay. The uh, country mouse here in the big city. <laughs> That's right. Um, no, so it was really great. I was in town, got here on Sunday and have been in town for, uh, gave a seminar at Columbia yesterday in the Department of Biological Sciences, hosted by Molly Przworski. You might remember Molly showed up on Twivo That's already right. in our third episode. Recombination. Recombination is for the birds. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, it was, it's been really fun. And in fact, more than just the seminar yesterday, um, starting even later tonight, actually, is the Biology of Genomes meeting mm-hmm. at Cold Spring Harbor Labs. And uh, so today is sort of a science doubleheader for me. I'm doing our in vivo Twivo. And then um, after this, I'm going to hop on the subway and then uh, get over to Penn Station out on the Long Island Rail to uh, Cold Spring Harbor. And then our session that I'm co-organizing this evening on population genomics um, is happening. I'm, in fact, the first speaker, and so sort of the warm-up band, you might say. Nice. Uh, so I'm going to try to save a little gas in my tank for later <laughs> <laughs> later this evening, but um, this will be fun. We're going to do sort of a um, preview, I would say, of the biology of genomes meeting with the work we're considering today. So uh, this paper we're going to talk about, are the authors actually at the meeting? Yeah, indeed. So the Mm -hmm. um, author of the paper, or I should say the um, submission to BioArchive, and we might get into some of the details (laughs) of that in a moment, is a fellow named um, Luis Barrio, probably butchering the last name here. Um, And he just, I think he started his lab maybe about five years ago, but about the same time I started mine. He's up at the um, University of Montreal, Canada, and does some really interesting work, uh, I would say, with one foot in population genetics mm-hmm. and another foot in um, sort of immune function, innate immune functions in particular. And so it's sort of near uh, top, some topics near and dear to my heart. Indeed. And I think also, you know, sort of gets at some of the energy we're looking for on Twivo 
looking at evolutionary approaches, coupling them to sort of experimental or wet lab approaches as well. So this meeting is right up your alley, right? It is. You know, I, it's the, it turns out, so the biology of genomes, this is the first time I will be at it. Um, I would say it's very much um, a genome science uh, mm-hmm. approach. So we see a lot of um, big data, a lot of the work, really interesting work done on um, un- annotating and understanding the human genome in particular. But it's a pretty eclectic meeting with a lot of things all over the map, some evolutionary genetics, population genetics, medical genetics. And so I feel like I've been sort of late coming to this. And so mm-hmm. I'm really thrilled to, to, to be out. Well, by the time we post this archive, um, they, th- they think they post something from the meeting that people can see, like the schedule or some sort of yeah. thing like that. We could post something. Yeah, good idea. I think there's even, um, at least in past years, and I don't know what it'll be like this time, but I think they actually record the talks and, and at least in some cases, live stream mm-hmm. them. And so, All right. um, yeah, we'll try to put a link out uh, for folks that might be interested in really looking uh, under the hood in detail at this meeting, because I think there's going to be a lot of stuff that our mm. listeners might be interested in catching up with. Have you been to Cold Spring Harbor before? I presume so, right? I actually have not. Oh. So, um, yeah, this is sort of <laughs> a um, really fun experience on uh, several levels. Um, I actually just made a quick peek out there before I came into the city. Um, after I landed at JFK, I have some friends out mm. there. And, um, really fun party on um, on uh, Saturday. So. so what you should do while you're at Cold Spring Harbor, um, you should uh, go to the Carnegie Library. It's a mm. freestanding building kind of away from the meeting hall. The meeting hall is a big uh, place near the parking lot where you first drive in. Mm-hmm. If you walk a bit kind of parallel to the road, down closer to the water, there's what's called the Carnegie Library. And uh, it's a library, but in, in the back there's a room called the Washlaw Shabalski Room. Now, I don't know if you ever heard of Washlaw Shabalski, but he no. was a, a geneticist and virologist. Mm-hmm. And I did a twim with him a couple of years ago, right there in that room. And the cool thing is, there's a big painting of him on the wall. Oh, wow. And we did the podcast right under his painting. But oh. <laughs> on the other side of the room, there's a glass case with memorabilia in it. And you can see... Al Hershey's kitchen blender in that glass case. Oh, wow. Fantastic. You should check that out. I will take a look. Thanks for the tips. Then there's another place. So Max Delbruck, Mm -hmm. founder of Phage School, right? He's a physicist who came over to Phage, and they have a building named after him. Mm -hmm. You should go in there because there are all kinds of drawings on the wall by him and other other people as well. It's really full of history. It's an amazing yeah. place. You, yep. know? you get that sense, even just walking on the campus for a few hours, yeah. it just has a it's kind of special energy to it. Yeah. It's just a cool yeah. place. Yeah, really fun to be here. Now, uh, we have a paper, which is a bioarchive paper, and I thought um, I could just tell you what's been going on uh, with bioarchive and me. <laughs> so I think the idea of putting up preprints is brilliant. Yeah. I love it, and... I wrote a couple of blog posts last week about papers on bioarchive on Zika, right? Mm-hmm. And I got a letter uh, from from a virologist who just thought this was terrible, a bad idea, and uh, he said there were ethical problems with mm. putting up preprints. I, I think he just didn't understand this concept that's gaining steam more and more. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. And he said, uh, you know, there are controls missing and this and that. And he said, you know, I have great respect for your scientific communication, but I'm a little disappointed that you wrote about this. Mm. So I found this insulting and uninformed on his mm. part. And uninformed because he clearly doesn't know about the bioarchive preprint revolution that's mm. going on, right? Mm-hmm. But also, I know I'm a communicator, but mm. I'm also a scientist. I know how to read a paper, and I know what's wrong and not wrong with it. Yeah. And I read it and I decided, I like this. I'm convinced, you know, there's some controls missing, but it's not going to change the basic conclusions. So I wrote a blog post and I linked to the paper. That's what I usually do. Yeah. And he and my colleagues said, oh, you should have said this is not peer reviewed <laughs> and all this. And I said to myself, no, I don't want to do that. First of all, if I said to the readers, this is not peer reviewed, what would they know? Yeah. The ones who are not scientists, they would say, well, what does that mean? And I don't want to explain it, right? There's no time for that in a blog post. And uh, then if I said, uh, you know, there's this control missing, this control, some people would say, well, what does that mean then? Do you like it or not? So I thought in the end I would just write, I like this. You know, here's one experiment that could be better. But overall, I think the conclusions are right. So, uh, you know, over on, we talked a bit about this on Twiv. And yeah. over on Twitter, there's been a lot of yep. discussion. You know, some people think, 
uh, preprints are not a good idea, but a lot of people seem to think it's really cool. Yeah, I can see kind of the argument a little bit on both sides. I mean, I, and uh, I mean, I guess as a partial disclaimer, we have in, from my lab recently posted on the bioarchive ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and in this case, you know, the paper um, converted and was just it's in press now at PLOS Genetics. And so this is an, a, another kind of um, emerging idea here that one of my colleagues, um, Jamie Fraser, describes as uh, beer and tacos, that you don't have to do one or the other. <laughs> and, so, and so you can do, you know, put your stuff out sort of rapidly. Yeah. And I think that is really the kind of massive advantage here is that we know of a lot of manuscripts that just sort of linger in peer review or get bounced from journal to journal. And in some cases, this can stretch um, for more than a year. Yeah, And in that time, that uh, data, for, to, by and large, can be sort of hidden from the science curious public, the science and scientists as well, to, I think, the detriment of the process of science. And so I think this is a really nice counterpunch exactly. to that. That's what I love. Yep. There are, I yeah. agree that there are, you know, there are some bumps along the road here and some issues we do have to think about. I'm also a huge advocate of peer review if it's practiced in healthy ways. I think that all of my work has been vastly improved by peer review. And I actually, even though some of my frustrations that we all, I think, um, share in some regards with our experiences with peer review are vastly sort of outshadowed um, or put to the margins compared mm -hmm. to the advantages and just how this has made my work really better. In some cases, I would say even saved my bacon from sort of publishing something that I would feel kind of regret later. <laughs> and so... And so I think it's actually, you know, a, a scenario where it can be good and bad. It's interesting, Vincent. So the um, meeting here, they're trying this new thing, a bioarchive channel. I've just heard of that today. You tell me what that is. Yeah, yeah. So what's going to happen or what has happened or in the process of happening now is that folks who have, you know, are presenting either at posters or talks at this mm -hmm. meeting and want to do more than just, you know, a, a collision at the poster or a 15-minute talk – can put uh, all of their unpublished work onto that they're covering into this bioarchive channel as basically a, a manuscript um, sized hmm. chunk. And then I think this is really uh, motivating two things. One is to get more of the information out. But secondly, one of the sort of, you know, hopes for the meeting is that people will um, actually present unpublished work. And so mm -hmm. by having this channel and sort of this new way of communicating or facilitating that discussion, the organizers I know are hoping that this will sort of spur people to be maybe play it less safe with only showing published work and to right. kind of get things out faster. So, right. so I think that's pretty so interesting kind that, of an innovation. Does that stay um, up after the meeting or? I believe so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, it's a place to kind of um, just organize around the theme of a meeting. We'll see. Mm -hmm. It's a, this is, I think it's, this is the first time it's been done, at least to my knowledge, and so we'll, uh, I think the folks at BioArchive who are at Cold Spring Harbor, incidentally. Um, that's right. That's want, right. Yeah, yeah. I think they want to do this um, or have said, you know, if you have another meeting, not that they're necessarily sponsoring there mm -hmm. at the lab, but anywhere that they're really interested in teaming up and doing this kind of thing. So I think it's something you to know, think so, about. Someone uh, said on Twitter today, mm -hmm. can we get a uh, BioArchive channel for ASV? Uh, yeah, I think that's a great idea. That would be good. I bet a lot of people would like to do that. So yeah, yeah. I, I'll connect the two of them up. Cool. Now, now the other concern people have with uh, preprint servers is that people are going to put up crap, yep. right? And it's going to dilute the field. <laughs> and uh, my response is, yeah, there may be some people, but for the most part, most scientists don't want to have crap associated with their name, right? Yeah, exactly. And so, I'll, you know, to be kind of you know, be honest on our front, we actually waited um, for couple of rounds of reviews before we put, put ours on. Really? Get, ultimately, the paper was rejected <laughs> from another journal. And so we were getting a little bit frustrated that it was sort of, huh. you know, in the weeds, but it had already seen peer review. And so it had been improved. And then I felt comfortable putting it up because it was to a level where I felt mm -hmm. like, okay, we can show this. And um, this is something that I want out there. And then um, it really went well. So once we then um, gave it to PLOS Genetics for consideration, um, the review went pretty smoothly. And so I think it can be sort of, a, I don't know, grassroots process in, in a few ways. I think uh, this is going to be the way most people do their their, their publications in the future. Yeah. They're going to put it on BioArchive or there, there are other servers too. As That's well. right. Yeah, I mean, there are, I think there are some like valid issues here. So the fact that um, there is really a lot of value to, or at least value to some degree placed on the peer review and the brand of a journal even. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think we all, on one hand can count the sort of high impact journals that we probably look at quite regularly. 
And they're really, that is the massive challenge here is there's really a sea of submissions. Um, and some are going to be good. Some are going to be a little dicey and kind of, you know, everything you'd expect all over the map. But Nels, you'll be able to tell, right? <laughs> so today you picked this paper. I yeah. presume you looked at it and said, this looks pretty good. Yeah. And if you saw something that didn't look good, you wouldn't podcast or blog about it, right? That's right. So, that's so, yeah, good point, Vincent. I think there are these new sort of ways that we're um, analyzing or sort of um, lifting up some work and maybe not other work. I, so, I just think it's it's yeah. just great. And yeah. I don't see that I have to do anything but link to the bioarchive paper. And, you know, if it turns out it's wrong, I'll write another blog and say, hey, <laughs> I was wrong about this. I don't have any problem <laughs> doing that. And that is good to see, right? Yeah. Scientists saying, oops, I made a mistake and let's fix it. That's right. Well, and by the way, <laughs> uh, by the way, we see the same thing in peer-reviewed papers all the time. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, in Twivo in particular. So I remember one of our first papers that we considered. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that was published, peer-reviewed and published in That's a right. in a uh, high-impact journal, PLOS Biology. Yeah. Um, we heard some uh, kickback from John Coffin That's about right. us being taken in by something. <laughs> That's right. And so in that case, we... <laughs> We weren't rescued by peer review. No, we were. It's and, and so I think that's important too that we don't sort of make peer reviewed papers sacred pieces of history. These are living, all. breathing documents with their warts and everything else, and that's this is all part of the scientific process. No, in fact, you, you know you've seen the, the the flood of Zika papers coming mm -hmm. out, especially in the high profile journals, mm -hmm. with a turnaround time of a week. Yeah, and you know we've gone over a few on Twiv, and there are things missing because. Yep. Because they're rushed, so you know it's not perfect. I'm nothing, nothing is perfect, and no human is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay, yeah. good. I I just look forward to many years of uh, finding cool papers on bioarchive and getting to read them a year before they're published. Yeah, I really like that, and, and kind of, and especially for today's episode, where kind of my hope was that we could it was all it'd be almost like surfing in on the meeting a little bit. Yeah, like we're walking up to a poster. And then um, able to kind of have that interaction and then share yeah. it with our listeners on Twivo. So. By the way, last thought about this mm. uh, peer, uh, this um, preprint server idea. Uh, Alan Dove pointed out on Twiv, mm. it's like going to a meeting and hearing a talk or seeing a poster. It's not peer reviewed, but you go, you listen to the talks, right? You take things away from it. Yep. Sometimes there are things that get corrected, uh, sometimes not. But I think that's what this is, really a formal way of... Uh, Having a toy, and you know the talks and the posters are never uh, circulated outside the meeting, and and it's a, this is a step beyond that. So. Yeah, I agree. That's a nice way of framing it. All right. Yeah. What do we have here, Nels? Okay, so um, what I ended up doing was um, kind of looking through the abstract book at stuff that I m thought might be good, and um, and actually that was exactly sort of the scenario that um, Alan was describing, which is I found this work uh, by Luis Barrero's lab. Thought it would be really fun to lift up for Twivo. And then bingo, la late last week, he put this on BioArchive and gave us a nice chance to um, really pick through it and then and look at this. And so a lot of the um, sessions, um, and especially tonight, so in the population genomics um, crew, what we're going to hear about is uh, a lot of human evolutionary history, actually, or uh, human genetics, which is we're getting some really cool and novel new views from the sequencing of Neanderthal genomes. And so this, um, actually speaking after me, um, sort of the, after the warm-up band, the rock star mm -hmm. that will be listening tonight is Fante Pebo ah. from um, Leipzig, Germany, the Max Planck Institute of Evolutionary Anthropology. And so he and others in the last decade have really made, I think, just spectacular breakthroughs in getting the genomes um, out of the bones hmm. of um, you know, remnants of archaic humans, Neanderthals, um, Denisovans, some other, some other sort of. Am I archaic? <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> no, Vincent, you're a mo you're a modern Homo sapiens. So rest, uh, rest comfortably. Homo sapiens would not are not archaic by definition, even though they're what oh. fifty thousand years old or so. Yeah, well, we were around. 000. I guess when when we say archaic, we're talking about um, species. In this case, of humans or, or from our genus Homo. That were um, that are no longer with us. So before Homo sapiens, correct. Okay, Homo neanderthalis, right? Exactly. Yeah. With, and the Denisovans were. We're not sure what they were. Is that right? 
Uh, yeah, good question. So I could I can definitely fill in a little bit of the. Um, this is uh, I'm really excited to be at this meeting since this is sort of actually a new field to me. I don't follow it mm. super closely, um, but I can certainly fill in some of the details on the Neanderthals. So the first thing that I didn't realize was that. Um, so the name Neanderthal. Do you know where that comes from? Actually, no, I don't. Yeah, so I guess there's a Neanderthal Valley in Germany. <laughs> And that's and that's where the bo- <laughs> some bones were found some years ago, and then this was named um, the Neanderthal. Um, and so the idea here, I didn't know that that's in- the, the Denisovans were after some area also. I, I think, think so. Yeah, it's a little bit like okay. I mean, this happens with viruses, right? So was, I was just thinking, yeah. you know, Four Corners, <laughs> which got changed to see Nombre because yeah. they didn't like that, but Zika, yeah. Ebola, River, et cetera. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. we name yeah. often after where they're isolated. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, Neanderthal. Is it with a T A L or T H A L? Some people spell it both ways. Yeah, right? exactly. So I think the um, valley is A L, and I then see. generally we talk about the archaic human or this, these ancient humans as um, T H A L. Neanderthal. Okay. Okay. People kind of pronounce it both ways. I think Neanderthal is what I mostly hear. Okay. And so um, the idea, and actually this will be, I don't want to, I'm kind of giving away already my pick of the week for later, but um, there's, <laughs> there's a nice video. By um, Svante Pabo, uh-huh. um, it's actually a TED Talk. Uh, from it's a little bit dated now, but he goes through some of this history and explains it much more elegantly. Oh, wow! Well, I'd love could. to watch that. Yeah, right. yeah. So it's worth taking a peek at. I mean, this field has exploded so much, even in the last four years, that what he's talking about is sort of the uh, you know kind of the first beginnings of this, and it's just gone crazy. But all of the background and some of the ideas are just as um, you know relevant today and a good sort of primer for what we're thinking about. So it's been driven by sequence, right? Yeah. So the real tricky part here, and this is what they worked out kind of in the last decade, was how to take these bones, extract the DNA from them, mm-hmm. and then um, distinguish between contaminating DNA, including our own DNA as modern humans, which you don't want mixed in, um, and then to put together an assembly of the Neanderthal genome in a convincing way. It's been, uh, I would say, mixed progress and really sort of um, hmm. fits and starts. But now things are, the technology has improved enough that there are some real insights coming into this. There's also been a, many more individuals found. And this has been a big breakthrough as well, because now you can start to compare between them. And this is actually revealing some really cool things about the genetic history Mm-hmm. of our species, including as we'll be talking about some collisions uh, between these archaic humans sort of subspecies and our own species and sort of the genetic aftermath that people are really interested in today. You know, um, I was, I did a twim a couple of months ago with Wyndham Latham. Oh yeah, who, yeah, yeah I know. You know, mm-hmm. play guy at uh, North, North Northwestern. Western. Mm-hmm. And he was telling the story of how they were, they had extracted DNA, uh, pulp from a tooth of an ancient human in a mass burial somewhere and they sequenced it and he said they had all this dark matter they couldn't figure out what it was yeah and it turned out to be yersinia yeah yeah and that's how they figured out that i know in fact it was around back then you know i, know, I love that oh. and then we have this, this is, i love this so this and now you have this um great um you know co-evolutionary history to act where we can um in essence we're like genetic time travelers mm-hmm. really going mm-hmm. back and seeing what the actual sequences are great so yeah. the neanderthals S- uh, samples uh, roughly how old are they you know yeah good question so um i know a little bit about sort of the timing of all this stuff so basically the i think the current idea is that so our ancestors came out of africa about 150,000 years ago mm-hmm. and w- as um these folks were kind of migrating up through europe and so forth uh, eventually east to asia they quickly realized they weren't alone and mm-hmm. <laughs> collided with these um, other subspecies of humans, Neanderthal included. Um, And so this was happening about 150,000 years ago. So they were already Mm -hmm. there much longer, something on the order of 400 to 500,000 years ago, I think Mm -hmm. are the Mm -hmm. estimates. And then where things got a little bit interesting, a little bit um, complicated, let's say, is when interbreeding started happening between the Neanderthals and our ancestors. And we know this because there's a bit of, Neanderthal DNA in ours, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's the only way it could have gotten there? That's the idea, yeah, these introgressions. And so... How many bases are we talking? Oh, that's what an introgression is. Correct, yeah. It means that two species mate in the DNA. Yeah. So, presumably, way back when, the first offspring had half and half, right? 
Yeah, correct. A hybrid. Yeah. So a, a, a fertile hybrid in this case. Yeah. They were fertile, correct. right? Mm -hmm. But why did we lose so much? Yeah, so this is really interesting. So part <laughs> the of the Andrew process talk. of introgression, and uh -huh. as geneticists, we think about this a lot more with our model organisms, is that you have you, you basically hybridize two subspecies or species mm -hmm. together. And if they're fertile, then you start backcrossing on one of those species. Yeah, and right. what happens is the, that sort of genetic mixing starts to get chiseled away by recombination and other things. And then you're left wow. with less and less. Wow. And so in this case, you know, I kind of, um, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I think, I, you know, what happened to the Neanderthals? They became extinct. I think there's a, probably a pretty good hypothesis that our species did some pretty terrible things to make yeah. that happen when we That's consider terrible. what our species uh, uh, historically has done. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting is there's still these remnants then, this, these intergressed parts of our genome mm. um, where we can see the history of this. And, and so the way that you discriminate this is to look at I mean, the real breakthrough was to actually have those Neanderthal samples in the first place, yeah, right? right? Because then now for the first time, these geneticists could make the one-to-one -one comparison of what did the Neanderthal genome look like? What does ours look like? And then very carefully determine which parts came from the Neanderthal based on these sort of linked differences, right. these linked right. genetic differences or haplotypes that are of Neanderthal origin. You know, I can't help but think that um, we we went up there and... We wiped them out, and you know, back then they would take the women, right, and right. rape them, and either bring them into their own or kill them all off, and that's probably where this came from, right? The conquest yeah. often involved that. Correct. Yep. And um, I wonder why the Neanderthals weren't able to defend themselves. You know, maybe they were not well equipped or peace loving or whatever. It's too bad, right? Yeah. No, there's some interesting, really interesting anthropology in there. But, but. we maybe we gave them our infections too. Right? That's another, absolutely. We've seen this in more recent human history where okay. this can kind of swing the um, fitness of another population is exposing them to novel pathogens that they haven't seen. Do we have any sense for how long the Homo sapiens and Neanderthals co coexisted? Yeah, it's a great question. I would be guessing if I said, I mean, one of the interesting sort of related points is that after the Neanderthals were gone, um, you can start to trace um, the loss of their, of really? that. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is, there's actually a great new paper mm -hmm. that I think we'll um, put up on the um, Twiv episode, Twivo episode. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, Freudian uh, Twiv slip here in Twiv studios. It's the <laughs> back at the mothership. I'm kind of, um, <laughs> Anyway, this is from David Reich's lab. He's at Harvard, and mm -hmm. they've been, you know, one of the cool things is because there's been more sampling and more genomics possible as the technology has gotten easier and easier, um, they've been doing sort of uh, chiseling away at uh, more recent ancestors mm -hmm. and watching the loss of the inter of the Neanderthal intergress DNA. Wow, that's great. And what's really cool in this paper, just it came out, I think, a week or two ago in uh, Nature, is that they were looking at like basically modeling from sort of population genetics theory, mm -hmm. how fast you would predict the Neanderthal sequences to be lost from our genome. And basically the theory matches almost precisely to what's observed here under a model of most of these mutations being mildly deleterious. And so the way the theory goes is that if you're a part of a small population or effective population size is the more precise population genetics term, then you're likely those genomes of those populations are likely to bear more mildly deleterious mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. mutations. And the idea that it's just based on genetic drift. So it's almost this idea of um, genetic sampling error. If you have a small mutation, you're more likely to see these deleterious things go through the population. Right. So, but what's really cool about this almost natural experiment as these intergressions happened and then our species continued to descend is that our, the homo sapiens population size is actually the effective population size is actually a lot bigger. Mm -hmm. And so then when these sort of mildly deleterious mutations show up in a bigger population, now natural selection sees them and they're pure or removed from the population. And in fact, those observations are matching exactly what a number of population geneticists mm -hmm. had said over the years really cool kind of advance here and thinking about bringing together the evolutionary thinking with some experimental evidence. And also there's this fascination we have with our own history, right? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Because for a long time it was all murky. We yeah. didn't know anything. And now little by little, you know, yep. I think people love to know where they came from. That's right. Yep. <laughs> Can't help but be curious. That's about part it. of the fascination with things like 23 and me, where you can, you know, have your genome sequenced and know 
sort of where you came from. And I had that done for my whole family. Oh, you did? Very yeah, yeah. How, what came out? A lot of unexpected stuff, you know. Um, so my wife is Irish-Polish, and I'm mainly Italian. And mm-hmm. one of our sons is <laughs> more Irish and Polish than Italian. Ah. She thinks that's funny. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm not going to probe too deep here. But, the- <laughs> um, you know, we had origins in places that we didn't know about, right? And uh, cool. the, other, the other thing is it's a social experiment because you put your sequence there and you, you say, I'm willing to share this. So you get a lot of people contacting you and say, oh, it looks like I'm a cousin. You want to chat? You know, and I've I've been put into contact with people in Europe wow. that oh, clearly wow. are clearly related to me. Huh. Right on my father's side, he came from Italy. Yeah. Ah, this is amazing, mm-hmm. and you know, you get a little information, and I say, "Yeah, you're from the same. Your mother was from the same town as my father." Oh my gosh, this is just mm-hmm. brilliant! I love really it. wild. I yep. Absolutely love. Did it. they did they have an option for you to type your Neanderthal haplotypes at all? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's done. Yeah, yeah. Well, not haplotypes. I think the only thing they had was what percentage of Neanderthal okay. yep. I was. Yeah, this is a slight marketing <laughs> gimmick, I would say. but <laughs> You know, but it varies, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so that's what they're doing a little bit, is tapping Apple into type. all of this kind of work to pull out the um, genetic differences that we can ascribe to these introgressions. Now, when you say um, Neanderthal haplotypes, mm-hmm. what, do, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so these haplotypes are basically, you know, imagine this, that... When the hybridization events were happening between these uh, our ancestors and these um, in the subspecies of humans, mm-hmm. that there are genetic differences, point mutations. Let's just say to keep it easier, SNPs. We sometimes talk about single nucleotide polymorphisms, which is just a mu- point mutation, basically. Right. If you just have one difference, it's really hard to kind of um, say that bo- that one mutation belongs to me or it belongs to my um, really distant Neanderthal great cousins or whatever it is. And so, um, however, if you now see a block of changes that are specific to one or another or a haplotype, so these are linked basically or closely sort of arranged differences or mutations. Um, and actually just by kind of gre- you know, grouping these together or um, measuring or figuring out what is grouped together, this is a really powerful way to do a number of things in genetics. One is to identify what came from who. And the other is to actually say something about the selective pressures that might have been acting on these sequences based on the arrangements and sizes of haplotypes, how many Mm -hmm. of these shared changes uh, segregate together. And we'll be talking more about that with today's paper, actually, or today's bioarchive. Can you um, go even further back? Because we have lots of non-human primates who are, we have, we share common ancestors with, is that... And we, we have sequences of their genomes in great detail today, right? Yep. But is that, can we make any inferences? I mean, we're 99% chimp, right? Yeah, correct. And 99.5% five, Neanderthal in the same sort of vein. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So can we make any inferences about genes that have come along from back then? Yeah, well? you yeah. could. I yeah. think from a population genetics standpoint, you actually do better by sampling more things closer to us okay. than more things distant. Makes sense. We do yeah. we absolutely though do look at the um genetic differences between us and other non human primates. And that's been that's sort of the um bread and butter of my lab and many others to mm-hmm. um, think about how um genetic functions are changing over time. Sort of a different, slightly different approach with sort of similar but complementary um implications potentially. Yeah. But you uh as you you're interested in host pathogen conflicts. Yeah. This could be I mean, you you might want to know what has driven the selection on some of these Neanderthal genes. Oh, yeah. I think this is fascinating. (laughs) Yes. So, um, and this has been, I think, a little slow in coming. You know, so one of the challenging things with looking just at human population data in in our very sparse sampling that we've done so far, and this is improving basically every week almost, but is that there's sometimes very little power to detect sort of these signatures of natural selection or these sweeps on these genes that we think these immune functions that might be responding or, you know, being selected because these are the things that allowed our population to survive some challenge um, in the historical past. And so um, that's what the um, work we'll be talking about from the Barrier Lab really starts to address actually is to try to take now for the first time this increasingly you know, sort of clear view of what the Neanderthals gifted us genetically, so to speak, and then to connect that 
all the way through to mm -hmm. the functional outcomes potentially. Um, and in particular, when it comes to surviving or dealing with pathogens that can have really strong impacts on fitness if we're sick or dying and unable to reproduce. Yeah, they make some predictions about what pathogens might be involved at the end here. Yeah, we'll get into that. Too. Quite interesting. Yep. All right. Yep. All right. So what did they do, Nels? Okay. So yeah, let's jump in here. So um, <clears throat> they first actually just took advantage of the fact that there have been, um, as we've already been sort of speaking about, lots of um, increasingly more data sets on Neanderthal genetics and the introgressions and that's been mapped at higher and higher resolution. And so what they've, what's been noticed and pointed out by several groups is that there's an area in our genome that involves a small family of genes, and we'll get to the sort of details of the immune functions in a moment. Um, but that, so this has been noted, and what they did is they looked at this, and um, this, this set of four genes, um, and they asked whether or not the reason um, that we see in high frequency these genes retained in our genomes, but gifted, so to speak, from the Neanderthals, is because natural selection acted on this. Mm -hmm. And so just as I was saying, sort of the preliminary work with kind of low-powered um, population genetics tests couldn't distinguish between these things being around in our genome for a reason or just sort of there by drift. There's, mm -hmm. you know, there's certainly right. things that are still kind of filtering in and out of the population just by chance as you sort of pull, pull genetic marbles out of the bag. Hmm. And so that's sort of the first half, I would say, of this paper is to um, deploy a couple of um, different approaches or, or population genetic tests to try to tease out whether there is a signature of these um, immune function genes or the mutations in them, the haplotype being selected from our uh, Neanderthal ancestors. So the tests in particular that they're using are, um, <clears throat> excuse me, what's called a H test, a um, Fei and Wu H test. This is developed by Justin Fei and Chung Yi Wu, University of Chicago. And basically this gets back to this idea of the haplotypes, right? These shared um, changes that are from mm -hmm. one source or another, in this case, the Neanderthals. And the idea is that if you see long haplotypes, this is way oversimplified to the kind of sophisticated um, statistics that are employed mm. here. But if you see longer haplotypes, that implies potentially a selective sweep that, um, and then given enough time, what happens is recombination, a subject we've talked about at some length um, in earlier Twivo episodes, starts to, um, you know, as time goes on, starts to break up the haplotypes as different parts of the chromosomes get rearranged. Mm -hmm. So these haplotypes mm -hmm. get shorter and shorter. And so the idea is that if a haplotype has been rapidly or has rapidly swept through a population, recombination basically hasn't chiseled away or made this region smaller. And so you apply then a test statistic to try to determine if this, these haplotypes are significantly bigger than you would predict just by sort of chance or neutrality or genetic drift. And so they, do this in a couple of new ways, um, mostly around the idea that it turns out there are these uh, recombination hotspots near these immune genes in particular. And so that could, what they argue is that that could be the reason why no one had seen clear signs of natural selection or positive selection on these genes before is that because recombination is just so rampant right in this genetic region that the haplotypes will look smaller than you mm -hmm. expect. So, and then they do also a second approach, um, coalescent modeling. And this is um, basically, again, kind of oversimplifying the population genetics and conceding that this is not my, um, uh, you know, expertise. But what they do, what you do here is you look at the frequency of alleles in a population. In this case, these immune genes in this region, it's about 190 kilobase region in the genome. And then you ask, um, you work backwards to sort of infer how these genes or these mutations would sort of rise or fall in frequency. And you can actually do, you know, with pretty good computing power, you can do many thousands of simulations and then ask given sort of different mm -hmm. models of how we predict given the demographics or the arrangements of the, how populations have sort of risen and fallen, how these alleles would show up at this high of a frequency. Basically these haplotypes would be at this high of a frequency and so doing those simulations, basically, I think they do it millions of times or something like this. And what they find is that the data only matches sort of the modern observation in something like 400 times out of a million. Mm. And so they use that kind of as a statistical evidence to say it's pretty unlikely that you would see this frequency of these haplotypes in our genomes today 
given sort of a neutral or a slightly deleterious okay. sort of explanation of drift. Yeah. It's not random. No, exact. Yeah. Now, how many human genomes do they look at? Do you remember offhand? Yeah. Good question. So they're using, for example, the Thousand Genomes Project. Okay. Which um, <laughs> I don't think it's exactly a thousand. I don't, and my, uh, the phase three that they use, which is sort of mm. the newest iteration of it, um, I, I can't remember. And these are different human populations. And so this will become an important point as well, is that you actually don't see the Neanderthal-like sequences um, in these genes, for example, in African populations, which okay. are represented in the thousand genomes at nearly as high a frequency and, or at all. And so this is- That makes sense, right? Yeah, right, exactly. So this is part yeah. of that historical model, right? That as yeah. humans left Africa 150,000 years ago, that they collided with the Neanderthals, but the African populations that remained and sort of spread out across Africa- didn't have this collision and yeah. therefore you don't see that haplotype. Now the spread from Europe to Asia and the Americas. Yeah. That was mainly from the European ancestors out of Africa, right? Correct. And yeah. Fewer people probably went from Africa directly to these other countries, but you might still expect to find some people in these other places without these Neanderthal genes yeah. as well, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, yep, absolutely. Interesting. Um, and that's where the um, Denisovans come in, actually. I think it's the next migration uh. from Europe to Asia, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and then we start to see, it's really cool, like because you have these other archaic populations, and then that starts mm -hmm. to give you more kind of insight or um, resolution on mm -hmm. how our ancestors migrated. So, so the mating with Neanderthals was actually, it wasn't a great thing that we did, but scientifically it gives us markers that we can follow right <laughs> that's right yeah <laughs> there's a great scientific outcome from <laughs> from this and it turns out a great genetic outcome so there have been a couple of um uh, regions of our genome proposed that this that um, natural selection has acted on or these have been beneficial mm -hmm. introgressions and mm -hmm. um, we'll get to this idea in a little more detail in a moment but um, one of them for example is this idea that folks living for in tibet or high elevation populations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, some of the genes that have been linked to doing well at high elevation are also thought to be uh, haplotypes that come from the Neanderthals. And so this is another potential kind of genetic gift, so to speak, um, in that area. The biology behind that is, I st would say, is still a little bit foggy um, because the, how the functions like allow yeah. a human to do better at high elevation is still a little bit debated and kind of the genetic connection, I would say, is still slightly... Um, weak in that case. But that's where, you know, I think these immune functions are kind of really good phenotypes to consider mm -hmm. because you can test basically, do you do better or worse against viruses, let's say, yeah, and then yeah. perhaps tie a real functional consequence to this. So maybe we should now, um, we've, I think we've talked, um, you know, about the sort of genetics or the history of this, and then we should maybe start linking this now actually to the immune functions and see okay. how that goes. So the region that we've, that I've been maybe a little bit too mysterious with <laughs> <laughs> so far, uh, involves a family of genes called oligodenylate cyclate, or sorry, excuse me, butchered that one, oligodenylate synthases. And so, um, OAS for short. And so it turns out these are really interesting, um, innate immune gene functions. And so the way this works is that the oligodenylate uh, synthases, OAS, I'll just call them OAS from now on, OAS 1, 2, and 3 in this family. There's a fourth one called OASL or OAS-like. These um, proteins coded by these genes, what they do is they actually sense double-strand RNA in the cytoplasm of a cell. So the proteins are just floating around or hanging out in the cytoplasm. If there's double-strand RNA that shows up in the cytoplasm, this is sort of like blood in the water for, an, for the innate immune system. <laughs> there shouldn't be double-strand RNA in the cytoplasm. And so usually when there is, that means there is a virus or some other invader, pathogenic invader in the neighborhood. And so what's happened is these proteins have evolved so that if they bind to double-strand RNA, they then the enzymatic activity is to build um, these two-prime, five-prime linked ATPs. So it's just taking ATP, the single molecule, and connecting it together through a covalent bond into these oligoadenylates. So you have these little strings now of ATPs that are kind of unusually shaped and not generally hanging out, in, again, in the cytoplasm. These guys act as what's called a second messenger to bind to another protein. This is a protein called RNase L, or ribonuclease L. And this is an enzyme that um, 
when it's first built is uh, silent. It doesn't do really anything. It just kind of hangs out. When it binds these secondary messengers, these 2,5 oligoadenylates or 2,5 OAs, it now kind of uh, wakes up and comes to life and starts chopping up ribosomal RNA, starts chopping up a lot of RNA. And the outcome of this is if you don't have any ribosomal RNA, you don't make proteins, you don't have a ribos functioning ribosome in the cell is going to die. But what will also happen is it will shut down as a viral factory, for example. And this is a great, turns out to be a great immune function. You kind of will sacrifice the activity of one cell to save the whole organism. Do you know what the L stands for? By the way, I think I'm going to take a guess. I don't, I'm going to take a guess <laughs> and say that people were just doing biochemistry and like, were just identifying RNAs and then came up and this was number L or yeah, le letter L. No? L means latent. La okay. Okay. Because okay. it needs to be activated, right? <laughs> okay. Even better. So that's, <laughs> it actually does relate to the biology here, which is that yeah. it's latent or silent until it binds to the second messenger and then it becomes active. You know, some uh, viruses actually require RNA cell for replication. I seem to remember a story of many years ago. Oh yeah, do you remember? Do you remember the details or which one it is? Yeah, I think it's polio. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is there are all of these cases of um, basically like these viruses. I would say turning the tables on our immune yeah. functions, right? Yeah. And so, yeah. is, and give these viruses enough time to adapt and evolve to something that we use to inhibit them, yeah. and. They'll do these sort of um, biological judo moves to use it back against us, and, and that, I, I'm not surprised at all. Endog endogenous retroviruses and uh, promoter elements, right? Yeah, no, now we're talking. Yep. We we did your paper in my <laughs> last week. I taught a a, a single uh, session to graduate students here, a paper, and we did your oh, fantastic the, the uh, paper that we discussed on TWIV. Cool, very right? cool. Yeah, I'll be talking about that a little bit later tonight at the biology meeting. Of genomes meeting. Yeah, yeah kind of preview cool. that and then tell a second story. Um, that again sort of involves these surprising um, twists of um, biological functions that get sort of employed for either host defense in the cases I'll be talking or for viral, proviral functions in, in, on the other side of the ledger. Might as well take advantage of whatever is offered to you. That's right. Either, yeah. In both cases, virus and host, right? Totally agree. I yeah. think we've, we've, at least I have, uh, scientifically uh, proceeded in an atmosphere where we always thought it was one way, right? yeah. but it's not. Yeah, yeah, As people right. like you and Harmeet and many others, Sarah Sawyer, have shown. <laughs> yeah, well, we were, I think we've been surprised as anyone else. It's sort of, you know, following your nose and then these things sort of um, appear. Is he going to be at the meeting or Sarah and any of those? Uh, I don't believe they will no? this time, but yeah, that's um, they, they've been there before, I believe. Yeah, There'll yep. be some other, um, I think it's really fun to see actually there's a number of sort of um, evolutionary immunologists and that's kind of, a, I'd say it's a growing field and sort of growing recognition. Um, so uh, yeah, I know lots of really great colleagues and, and uh, interesting science on hand. Neat. So, okay. So let's, so now we've, I've mentioned these OAS genes mm -hmm. and so it turns out in this 190 KB region that we've been discussing for it being introgressed from the Neanderthals, mm -hmm. and then the evidence um, from this manuscript that these things have been selected, they're here for a reason. So it turns out this is that 190 KB contains OAS1, OAS2, OAS3, and OASL. So OAS1 is thought to be the ancestral copy, and then it duplicated, mm. um, and mm. actually more than that, duplicated and sort of doubled in size through a gene fusion and then um, triplicated in size for OAS3, and then it's just a single copy for OASL. It's sort of an outlier. We'll ignore that guy for now on. So when genes duplicate, uh, it's an accident, but then it turns out to be useful, so it sticks around, right? Exact, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it, it's an accident, yeah, and then if it's, it can kind of, again, either just sort of degrade or filter out if mm -hmm. it's not sort mm -hmm. of worth anything. Um, by chance, it might be culled out of the population, or if there's something rarely beneficial, then you might keep it around. It looks like we now have good evidence, some a little bit of it from my lab, that, o, that this OAS family has been kept around, um, in, and I should say not only in humans, but in mammals in general mm -hmm. um, for a really long time. It's really cool. If you look in the mouse genome, mm -hmm. um, there's not just four of these things, there's something like a dozen or maybe even two dozen of them. Wow. Yeah. So there it's been a really volatile history of gene duplication. So how far back are all mammals have uh, OASs? Yeah. And in fact, the um, for for um, immune functions, for sure, mm -hmm. the actual enzymology is super ancient. So it goes all the way to Archaea, actually. Mm. And so these in the, the way that that's been 
looked at are these funny two prime, five prime linkages of ATPs, mm -hmm. which are not sort of the usual yeah. three prime right. involved right. ones that we think about for DNA and other sort of more mainstream um, uses of nucleic acids. And so, yeah, that's, uh, mm -hmm. and then it's, so then the question becomes that enzymology has been around for billions of years, the immune function, not as long, but certainly in, in the mammals. Yep. So then basically the next question, if putting together these immune functions to this um, evolutionary story or population genetic story is whether if by comparing the functions of the OAS variants that were provided by the Neanderthals, mm -hmm. do those give us today potentially an advantage in infections that we're facing today? And, you know, the nice thing about this is we haven't, because the um, Neanderthal intergression, we're, we're talking about, you know, 150,000 years or less. And so this is really recent and it kind of gives you the opportunity to catch something more in the act. If we're, if we're thinking about the divergence between non-human primates and us, that goes so far back that the kind of conflicts with pathogens may or may not represent what we're dealing with today. And so by kind of narrowing that window, I think that's sort of a cool potential implication here. Okay. So what they do then um, is they take some of the, um, they take macrophages from about a hundred people, European descent. And these cell lines, uh, these cells, these macrophage, cell, macrophage cells are treated with salmonella, infected with salmonella. And then they do, uh, or they collect, or uh, I don't know if this data set already existed, yeah, but they it did. That's okay. a data set. Okay. <laughs> okay. So they, <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> okay. Yep. So they, just sort of, you know, collide the um, all of the genomics work that was done with another data set that someone else did, and then, and yeah, which is you know a good use of existing data, and then ask, looking at the RNA sequencing, whether you see differences of an, of expression of the OAS genes mm -hmm. under this condition of infection, comparing the Neanderthal-like sequences to the humans that don't have that. So you could use macrophages from Africans, for example, right? That yeah, only yeah, that yeah. haven't been exposed. And so they make a couple or they pull a couple of observations from those existing data. One is that they actually see lower expression of OAS3. Mm -hmm. And so that is a functional difference. However, this is where the, I'd say the waters start to get a little bit murky, is that if you have less OAS3, that might not be an advantage depending on the pathogen challenge that you're facing. Right. You might think sort of at least simple mindedly that having more OAS3 would be the advantage here. You would think, yeah. You would think. And in fact, there's another paper that just emerged um, from Susan Weiss's lab mm -hmm. at Penn. And what they had done, and actually I just spoke to her about this um, a little bit last week. Um, this is published in PNAS, I think around January. They had taken some cells and had knocked out using CRISPR either OAS1, OAS2, or OAS3. Mm -hmm. And then they infected those cells with several different viruses and asked, does the virus do better in the absence, preferentially better in the absence of one mm -hmm. over the other? And they got this really striking result, which is that OAS1 and 2 were sort of disposable, mm -hmm. but you really wanted to have OAS3 there as a cell if you didn't want to be absolutely run over by the viruses. Mm. So Vi removing OAS3, more virus replicate. Correct, yeah, correct. Which is contradictory to the Neanderthal result you just told that's us. That's right. Weird, why would we keep a Neanderthal gene that's lower? That's right, yeah, 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 <laughs> right? exactly. So here I think we need to kind of step back. And <laughs> and so I think the first interesting thing is that there's any functional difference at all. And I think that's the part that's kind of convincing. Mm. It becomes much harder though to put this together to sort of, um, what this means for an infection doing better or worse. Because remember, the data set they're using is from salmonella, yeah, whereas yeah. that other data are from four human viruses. I think it was, um, uh, what are they? Um, Susan's, you mean? Yeah, Susan, used, they used West Nile, right. um, Syndibus, Influenza, and Vaccinia. Right. And so these are very different pathogens. Mm -hmm. And so could it be that if they used other ones that OAS3 would go up? or you know, So there's all of this sort of complexity that actually starts to come in in this might muddy the waters a little bit. Hmm. But so they actually went on and so they did another, I think this might be the first experiment they did. Is that, is that? Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Finally, they had to do an experiment. <laughs> right, now we're talking, oh, I yeah. would say, I would say wet experiment. Wet experiment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Computational biology are experiments too, right? Absolute. Absolute. Right. Yep. Yeah. So they took, they got, um, uh, blood cells from, um, 30 people. And then they either infected the cells 
with uh, influenza or uh, herpes virus, um, or stimulated with poly IC. This is actually sort of a mimic of double strand RNA. And so even in the absence of infection, if you just treat with this um, molecule, mm. um, this will kick off basically the OAS um, activity. And so turn up these interferon stimulated genes. We should maybe mention that, that all of these OAS genes are generally not expressed or expressed at very low levels, I should say, sort of like just surveillance levels. Right. And then as an infection starts to move through an organism, uh, what happens is we have this massive interferon signaling response. These genes are responsive to that and our, their expression is turned up. And so you make either a lot, you make a lot more of them um, generally as the infection sort of continues and in cells that are not yet infected to sort of, this, this kind of sounds the alarm of the innate immune system. So in this case, they actually saw, they again just looked at expression. And I think we might want to um, keep that in mind that the functions we're measuring are not necessarily whether the virus does better or worse or the salmonella does better or worse. It's just whether you make more or less of something that might help you defend against this as an infected cell. So in this case, they actually see a kind of an interesting difference. So it turns out, you know, we, we've already spoken about how um, OS1 in the family has undergone these ancient duplications. And in rodents, for example, it's been example, it's been really volatile. Um, another layer of complexity here is that there's all of this alternate splicing of the OAS1 gene. And so what this means is that in addition to basically those copies is even a single copy, you might, you know, include or exclude exons that actually give the OAS gene different function. And so what they saw here was when they infected those PBMCs with people who had the Neanderthal-like sequences, they saw the expression increase of one of these alternate spliced forms of OAS1. This is called the P46 isoform. It's defined by its size. It's on a protein gel. It's 46 kildaltons. And so other folks have shown that that actually turned that splice form, uh, P46, actually can have um, really good antiviral activity. The reason for this might actually be that it's missing a different piece of, or some other exons that might be inhibited by viruses. And so it's mm -hmm. by taking, it's like less is more almost by yeah. just not including this exon, you get more activity. And so the fact that they saw more of this potentially, you know, effective version or variant of OS1 led them to the hypothesis or the conclusion that perhaps that's like the gift of the Neanderthal mm -hmm. um, introgression is that now folks that have that are able to turn on in response to these viruses, a more spicy version of this immunity gene, that that will then activate RNA cell, that will start to chew up the ribosomal RNA, the cell will stop making proteins and the virus can't make proteins and the virus can't replicate. So this um, would suggest that in time two and three are gonna be removed in the human population. Right? Yeah, well, so that's one of the interesting things about these immune functions is in fact, um, you know, something that might work for you one day may not another, or something that works for you against one virus mm. might be inhibited by another, sure. right? And so having sort of a diversified arsenal, I think is one of the themes that is sort of emerging from a lot of this work. Um, I think they certainly get hints of that in the data they present as part of this manuscript, yeah. um, right? That you get expression up or down in different ones. This also kind of makes it a little bit messy or difficult to think about, you know, so we talked about this 190 KB haplotype. Yeah, It's all kind of together. And so um, as it's moving through the population, if we come back, you know, 150,000 years or whatever, half a million years from now, will some of these be chiseled away? I think it kind of, it's really hard to know. Mm -hmm. Maybe it depends on what our population faces or what happens. Are there extreme bottlenecks or, you know, who knows the um, genetic complexity can sort of um, add up really fast. I guess we, we shouldn't assume that everything is equal globally, right? On all population. No, no, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> Every, yep. Everyone's under different selection. They have different other parts of their genome are different as well. And that could make an impact too. No question. That's right. Yep. Right. And this again, I think kind of highlights how, the diversity, even of human populations, has a hand in, um, you, you know, as we look at Zika virus, for example, and how it's spreading, there are just all these contingencies when, yeah. when it comes out of Africa and moves to South America. 
uh, where the genetics and actually the exposures to other viruses, and in this case, dengue, I think is a, a, a strong example, mm-hmm. has a complicated outcome on how people respond or don't respond well to these challenges. Well, the neat thing is we can watch it now. We can, yeah. we can see this because we can see both the virus and our genome and make sense of it, whereas you know, 20 years ago, we couldn't do that. That's right. I think the combination of the um, technology for looking at genomes along with just sort of as we've learned, I mean, it just opens up a whole new world of thinking about this. And we have so much to learn. I mean, all, we, mm. even now, I think this, you know, this is a great example. The reason I, I wanted to do this paper, it has, I think, a few warts and a few rough edges. But what it does, I think, really nicely is it kind of goes from and combines different approaches, both the um, functional consequences with the observations of the genetic variation and kind of illustrates how this is now possible mm-hmm. almost for the first time and that labs can do this themselves. You know, you can actually cover a lot of ground. This is falls really closely to this idea of this functional synthesis that we've been talking about on Twivo yeah. in our first several episodes. So what do you make of the idea that Flavy viruses might have been the drivers of OAS1? Yeah, evolution? good question. So this is another part that I'd say might... Um, we'll see how, how um, if that conclusion, this mm-hmm. is in the discussion. Mm-hmm. Basically, the idea here is that I think they have not so they looked at some other data, I believe that's published with Flavy viruses, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, yeah. And then, um, and how that affects um, the expression or the functions of the OAS genes and um, try to link this together as what, you know, so we, this question comes up all the time, which is basically, okay, if this was selected, this intergression was selected in our ancestors leading up to today, what were the viruses that did that? And so mm, yeah. it's, I think it's, you know, it's <laughs> tempting to put your finger, like we're very cautious about this, especially if we're thinking about really deep evolutionary time. It's tempting to start to do this in this case, because the, basically the time window has narrowed, but I would caution that, you know, there's been a lot of pathogenic challenges in addition to Flavy viruses. Sure, and sure. we just, you know, even going back before our medical history, now we're only talking about a couple hundred years you know, going out to 150,000 years is quite a different thing. And so I would be a little bit cautious. Um, yeah, there might've been things around that we don't even know about exactly. anymore, right? Yeah, right? yeah. And so it's yeah. tempting to, yeah, I mean, it's tempting to try to put your thumb on it. At the same time, what it does illustrate in all these cases, I think, is that um, a lot of these viruses, a lot of these pathogens sort of converge on the same functions. OAS has been a really successful immune function. Yeah. And yeah. not only sort of from this recent contribution from the Neanderthals, but as we were mentioning before, as an immune function in mammals in general. And so um, as a consequence, uh, a lot of viruses have had to figure out ways to try to contend with OAS signaling uh, and have come up with sort of a variety of different inhibitors, um, which may or may not be relevant at different times versus, you know, in in our history and the history of primates and even out farther to the history of mammals. Yeah. They, they select some data on flavy viruses that are associated with uh, reduced infection with this uh, P46 variant of OAS one, but yep. you know, that as you say, there could be other things out there that we don't know about. And as we saw, there were different results uh, with their in vivo stimulation as well. So, yeah, exactly. Probably Vincent. too and, simple. And this is where I think Susan Weiss's paper, like I think yeah, that needs yeah. to be a little bit weighed in this. The fact that OAS three looks like it's really the uh, for some flavy viruses, in fact, is yeah. the game. Yeah, that's right. And, and not OAS one and two. That's and right. so P forty six that becomes a little bit cloudy here. So in the review, if you were reviewing this, you would say to them they need to discuss the Weiss paper in their discussion. I would. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I think maybe step back a little bit from the strength of the conclusions mm-hmm. on the idea that it was the Flavy viruses and sort of just put it into maybe a kind of a fuller picture here with some of the other data that's out there. So what, what can we conclude that we, yeah. as human, some humans, not all have inherited uh, OAS genes from Neanderthals. OAS one appears to be uh, the one that is involved in uh, infections. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't know if it's uniformly, we don't know what selected it, right? Correct. But so that's what I think the step forward here is that they show, I think, um, decent evidence that there is a signature of natural selection here. That had okay. not seen been seen okay. before. So we've kept it, right? Yep, it's been kept around. I kind of am, I'm, I think that's somewhat compelling. Mm-hmm. Uh, I then think what they've done is then said, okay, if that's the case, let's start to put a functional consequence to yeah. this. I think yeah. they've gone part of the way there. I think they nicely... Um, you know, use some existing data sets. I think that also muddied the waters a little bit and that they could acknowledge that some. 
And then for the next steps forward, I mean, I would certainly be tempted to drill down a little more deeply Mm -hmm. um, on not only sort of the difference of expression in some of these human cell lines, but to really take these Neanderthal donated sequences and to test functional outcomes against uh, Mm -hmm. in actual viral infection assays um, to see uh, if that kind of line of reasoning follows all of the way through. And there it does, you know, and I would say that that becomes a little bit complicated because we have, again, these things are all together Mm -hmm. on this um, 190 KB region. And so this is a, this is a kind of a classic problem with a lot of population genetics work to link a function to a region in the genome is that you sort of have only so much resolution. And so is it that it's really all three of these genes that are somehow contributing or just one of them and the other two are in the background? And I don't think we're quite at that level of resolution yet with this work, but my goodness, what a fun um, step forward, I think in in a lot of ways. And you're going to hear the author talking about this at this meeting, right? Yeah. So this will be, you know, one of those things where you just walk up to a poster and, you know, maybe you know that the work is going to be there and you want to get more of the details or you're just sort of surprised by it and then have these really fun, you know, 15, 20 minute conversations. Yeah. You might find out something more. Yeah, exactly. And then, and you kind of have these like inspiring Mm. sort of things that happen. And so, yeah. And that was, what we were trying to do here a little bit with this um, paper was to sort of peel back and see what that, what that process might feel like. So let me understand. There are other blocks of genes that we've gotten from Neanderthals as well. Yeah. Right. right, But why did they focus on OASs? Do you know? Yeah. So that was, this is definitely one. I think there've been now, even in the last few years, um, uh, people as they've looked, so what's happened up until now, state of the art was to do more and more to sequence and analyze more and more Neanderthal genomes Mm -hmm. and then try to pull out what are the sections that look like they're convincingly from Neanderthals. And so the OAS area has been on the radar for a few years actually, but no one has really picked it up from there and taken the next step. And so that's, what's happening. It's definitely like, you know, as the authors say in the beginning Mm -hmm. to try to distinguish between neutrality and selection, that was sort of the motivation here. Yeah. 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 Are there, any examples of a similar study done in closely related non-human animals? Yeah. So, um, thank you. I don't know if you knew, but thank you for asking that. <laughs> you're, you're, this is like a softball question. So this is my, <laughs> my lab, um, published a piece of work, uh, in PLOS genetics last year. Uh, one of my postdocs, Dustin Hanks did this work to look at the evolution of the OAS family among non-human primates. Mm-hmm. Humans are included there as well. And what we see is really cool. So, the strongest signature of positive selection and this, and by this, I mean the most number of positions in the protein that are changing really rapidly are in OAS one. In fact, it's not even close. This is like among a lot of the innate immune functions that we've looked at. OAS one just really screams out as being just riddled with all of these changes. And so now we're talking about not only changes like, so amino acid substitutions, um, all of these duplications, and then also these splice variants. And so it's really a hot spot of mm-hmm. a lot of kind of uh, what looks like the evolution of conflicts. And so what this, I think the implication is that a lot of ancient and modern viruses have really paid attention to mm-hmm. this function. Mm-hmm. And then what's kind of cool um, is that if you look at OAS2 and OAS3 and do the same, like basically sequence it from the same collection or sampling of primates, and then ask how many residues are changing rapidly there, there's about half as many in OAS2, mm-hmm. despite the fact it's almost twice as big. And then half as many again in OAS3, despite the fact it's three times bigger. And so there's this really kind of cool pattern that we're still trying to kind of put our thumb on as we're thinking about the next steps to try mm. to understand how yeah. these things have sort of, yeah, been evolving over millions of years and not just sort of in the last 150,000. Well, they, they note in their discussion that OAS1 is the in the top 1% of genes showing the largest level of nucleotide diversity among ape species. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There have been a few groups that have, I should say, it's not only us, there have been a couple of groups that have made this observation. Yeah, yeah. They don't don't actually reference that statement. Yeah, and this is always a delicate thing as a reviewer. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's, isn't that the function of peer review to get your work cited? (laughs) Yeah, no, no. (laughs) I mean, if there's something that should be in there, then fine, but you have to be a little bit... Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I, I always feel badly when it's needed that they cite your work, but because uh, I don't like to feel yeah. self-serving. But sometimes it has to be done, right? Yeah, yeah. there's. I think there are three papers that you could cite yeah. actually that make the Neat. that could support that part of the discussion. Do you want to do a couple of uh, email before you leave here? Yeah, let's uh, do that. Um, I think there's still time before I have to get on a yeah, there is train, so we can 
All right, before we do that, let me tell you a bit about our sponsor, Curiosity Stream. Yeah, I'm, curi- I'm curious to, to hear. This uh, episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, which is a subscription streaming service. It's the world's first ad-free nonfiction streaming service. It's founded by John Hendricks, who is the founder of Discovery Communications, which you may know as a producer of a variety of science shows. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You'll find over 1,400 titles and 600 hours of content, 196 countries you can find this in, and you can... Play it on any platform you might like, Roku, Android, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, Amazon Kindle, and Apple TV. The cool thing for our listeners, it has a wide variety of science and technology content, as well as other things like nature and history and much more. And they're starting to build a 4K library. Mm. I don't have a 4K TV, so. Yeah, me either. <laughs> wouldn't make a difference, but uh, I think I've heard that's the future, yeah, so. Correct. At you least know, for a few years, and then it will be whatever the next big thing is. Did you ever see this thing, uh, Planet Earth, I think is the name? It was uh, it was a it was a HD movie put together, and uh, it's just scenes of the Earth all, all over oh, it. Oh, yeah, gorgeous. sounds familiar, yeah. It's called Planet Earth, right? Yeah, that sounds so right. Yep. They're, they're reshooting it in 4K. Oh, wow. I mean, this is involved going all around the world and getting exotic animals, you know, that yeah. you don't see all the time. And they, they decided, well, 4K is the thing. Yeah. But then what are they going to do with an 8K company? I know. You shoot it have to just, it's, a, it's an arms race. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they also have interviews and lectures like Stephen Hawking's Universe, Next World with Michio Kaku. They also have a, a little virus collection. If you search for viruses, you can find a collection. They have one called Viruses, Destruction, and Creation. Mm. And they talk about Zika, of course. Mm. They're very timely. That's a good idea to yeah. do that. And many, many others. These are, so basically, these are real science shows, not reality TV science shows. Yeah. But you can find plenty of other places. You can get monthly and annual plans. And they start at just $2.99 a month, less than a cup of coffee, or the cost of renting one movie on you know some of the competing platforms. Yeah, well, in New York, that's less than like half a cup of coffee. Yeah, you can't get a cup for two ninety nine. <laughs> if you can, you don't want to drink it, probably. <laughs> How about in Salt Lake? Is coffee two ninety nine? Uh, it's actually even more expensive in Salt Lake because there's a, <laughs> <laughs> there's a big you know hipster coffee grinding and yeah, roasting right, scene. So right. yeah, yeah, those yeah. have a good uh, brew brew scene, right? In Salt yeah, Lake, Is yeah, yeah. Right? It's surprisingly good. I look forward to that when I visit. Yeah, yeah you yeah, bring yeah. me to a little brew pub. We'll do it. We'll um, hit a few if uh, yeah, we can things go according to plan, and then we yeah. can do a Twivo right there. Because there we are talking. <laughs> Check out curiositystream.com slash microbe. Use the promo code microbe during sign up, and you'll get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series completely free for the first 60 days. That's two months free of one of the largest 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash microbe. And use the offer code microbe at startup. <laughs> at sign up, actually, not startup. Yeah, yeah. We thank Curiosity Stream for their support of Twivo and all the other, uh, what do we call, microbe TV programs. Yeah. Appreciate it. Definitely. Have faith in our listeners. So check them out. Might as well sign up for a free two month subscription. Yeah, count me in. You know? And uh, there's some cool stuff there. But, of course, we don't want you to take time away from listening to Twivo. (laughs) Tacos and beer, or beer and tacos. All right, we have a bunch of email. We won't get to them all, but... Yeah, wow, look at this. The mailbag is starting to fill up. Yeah, we like it, right? This is exciting. Yeah, the first one's from Peng Fei, who writes, Dear Vincent and Nels, probably Peng Fei, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have just finished listening episode six of Twivo. Great podcast, and thank you for the opportunity for free professional development. I am an associate professor at Thomas Nelson Community College in Hampton, Virginia, and have previously worked as a postdoc at Harvard University and the Medical University of South Carolina. So I recognize quite a few people that you've brought up in the show. I was trained as a microbiologist and molecular biologist, so I listened to TWIM all the time. I was really excited to meet Michael and Michelle at last year's ASM meeting and was a little disappointed that you were not there. (laughs) I hope to meet you this year in Boston in June. I'll be there. I'll be there. You, you'll you be there too? Yeah. Are yeah, you yeah. serious? Yeah. Night in about a month. Yep. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, we might have to coordinate on something. Yeah, we'll talk yeah. for sure. In this episode of Twivo, you and Nels talked about whether the genes of one organism have been put into another organism, and Nels thought it was a helicobacter species that Craig Venters Institute uses the host, but in fact, it was the mycoplasma genitalium species 
His institute joined together a minimum set of genes and injected the artificial genome to mycoplasma. It was successful, and they named it Cynthia. I believe the work was done in the August of 2010. I look forward to the next episode. Best regards, Peng Fei. Yeah, thanks for that letter, Peng Fei. And thanks for the correction as well. That's exactly right. And I think there's actually a, another chapter that just came out in the last month or two on Cynthia V2.0 or something like this. And it was, right. did you see that? Yeah, That's we it. did it on TWIM. Okay. So they made a minimal, they they made a, something like a 500 KB uh, mycoplasma genome. Mm-hmm. And it, I think, and I don't remember the details, the doubling time went from 19 hours to 19 minutes or something. Oh, wow. Really get rid of all that stuff that you don't need to grow in rich broth in the laboratory. Yeah, yeah, know? interesting. It was amazing stuff. Yeah, and the other interesting side note on that, I thought, was that when Craig Venter was describing the work and how arduous it was to mm-hmm. start, sort of narrow down on a smaller gene set, that seemed like a remarkable, like, so Craig Venter, I think, is not known for, you know, his humbleness <laughs> <or> modesty, <laughs> and so that right. was sort of a breath of fresh air to acknowledge that yeah, yeah. Um, there's, we still have a lot to learn about this, even as we're making new progress, or even as his group did this this next really interesting step. I mean, that the paper, the recent one is in Science, yeah. uh, very recently, and just a tour de force of yeah. the stuff they did to synthesize this and make sure that there are no errors and so forth. And transplanted, they they call it installing the operating system in a new cell. Yeah, right. Yep. So they have to add selection to get rid of the old genome, yeah, you know, and make yeah. sure the new one is selected. Yeah. It is really cool Pretty stuff. provocative, yeah. Yep. We also got a, a correction. <laughs> <laughs> this is an emerging theme here. This is from, on Twitter. Yep. Berlin Bug Girl mm-hmm. uh, said, Butterflies lay eggs, viviparous insects like aphids, tsetse flies exist, and they're super cool. I guess we were talking... You and I were talking about butterflies and didn't know how they reproduce, right? <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, we, I did. No, I, I think I um, pretty awkwardly tried to explain it and kind of off the cuff. And so it was pretty, um, uh, the most generous interpretation was that I was very unclear. And so thank you, Hannah, um, at Berlin Bug Girl. Exactly mm-hmm. right. And more than that, I mean, this is exactly um, why it's great to get a correction is then she pointed out these um, viviparous insects giving live birth. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. So now I'm kind of excited to, um, you know, pursue that. Yeah, it's very bit. cool. So, yep, we, thank lo- you. we like the, yep. the social media. Definitely. Why don't you take the next one now? Okay, so Ross writes, Hi, Tweevo gang. Loving the podcast so far. The discussion in the last episode about the evolution of Ebola and its host receptor was probably my favorite yet. Having the senior authors on the show to discuss the paper was excellent. Anyway, I came across a really bad creationist misunderstanding of evolution on Twitter today, pictured below. I'm not sure if we have the picture. Oh, I have to find it while you're talking. Okay, which inspired me to tweak it a bit to make it hopefully more accurate. Let me know what you think. I haven't looked at it, but um, we'll get to that maybe eventually. Evolution is sort of like photocopying a photocopy for millions of years. Maybe you start out with a painting that vaguely resembles a cow. Each time you photocopy the previous photocopy, the resulting picture looks more or looks more like a cow. The ones that look less like a cow get thrown away. And the ones that look more like a cow are kept as the next copy to be photocopied until eventually the picture looks more and more like a cow. Over time though, people's tastes in paintings change. So the copies that get accepted and rejected change over time. This then is evolution, constant refinement, depending on, on the changing environment. Mm. Regards, uh, Ross Balch, who's a virology PhD student in Queensland, Australia. So what he sent was a tweet, Okay, said, which reads, DNA entropy, think of it this way, a copy of a photocopy of all life for 600,000 plus years. Lie to yourself if it gives you comfort. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so <laughs> I think we've kind of... Um, uh, Ross is sort of um, unearthing a couple of ideas here. So I would say uh, a few things. So one is, you know, it really is tricky to sort of, um, I think, capture the process of evolution um, in an analogy. And um, and I'm not trying to take the high road because I use kind of half-baked analogies constantly as a professional um, device um, and and as a teaching device as well which can have its trade-offs. But I think, you know, maybe the deeper question here is really, you know, when we look at, um, and a lot of friction sort of, I think, comes up over this idea that when we look at something like a, you know, modern 
complicated species, and we can use the cow as an example, is how do you get there from something like a single cell critter that just swims in the pond? And so I think the first thing to do is to maybe step back and say, this took a really long time, more than our brains can sort of um, comfortably accommodate. And so it's really, that to me is really challenging because, you know, my brain, I think about what happened last week. And if you, <laughs> if you add uh, orders and orders of magnitude on top of this, it's really tough to just sort of intuit what yeah. that kind of, what can happen on that time. And so I think that's where some of the friction comes because you really need a lot of mistakes and sort of um, uh, combining with just really low probability events to so slowly build on and select on traits over a long time. And so I think it's, um, it's pretty tough. I mean, the photocopying analogy does get at this idea of a little bit, I think, of selecting for something that looks more like a cow. The difficulty with that analogy, I would say, is that you might go through a lot of intermediate steps that look nothing like a cow at all. Mm. And so then I think, you know, the danger is that you can kind of confuse the waters a little bit there. And so it's, a, um, I mean, it's, it is absolutely important that we have these discussions, that we argue about it, that we look at the evidence and really um, try to do that as well as we can. And I thank Ross for bringing this up. Um, this is a challenge to continue to do this in an effective way. And so it's important to think about. I, I often try and start at a cell and mm. try and figure out how you get to a monkey or a cow or something. Yeah. I, I stop after about 10 minutes because I can't, because <laughs> as you say, it's so long, yeah. we can't grasp it, right? Yep. The other kind of <laughs> maybe... Um, it's so a slightly tangential, but the point I want to make is that, in fact, you know, those single cells that are still swimming in the ponds, it's not that they're primitive. And in fact, we see all of this biological complexity. They've been mm -hmm. evolving just as long as we have. Yeah, right? sure. Absolutely. And so there's all this biological complexity that's just sort of played out in different ways. And, you know, another kind of common um, uh, topic that people sort of stumble into is this idea of the intelligent design of the, of the eye. But we actually see eye-like functions in single cells or like very um, what people think of as primitive. These aren't primitive things. These are modern species that have sort of converged on, they've had, they have to solve a similar problem, which is reacting to light. And so the, all of this really interesting biology that can play out on all of these different levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's good stuff. Uh, next one is from Adam who writes, in regards to some discussion on Tweevo 5 about the arms race between viruses and mammals, it may be useful to look at it from a slightly different perspective. The mammalian immune system engages in a sort of asymmetric warfare and that much of immune surveillance is targeted toward altered or damaged self in contrast to pathogen-targeted T and B responses to specific viral peptides and proteins. For example, IL-1 family members are immunologically potent indicators of cell stress or death detectable by diverse groups of immune cells. Some of these mediators, IL-1B, IL-18, are produced in a proform requiring activation by cellular caspases downstream of inflammasome activation. Others are sequestered inside the cell and likely released as a result of necrosis, IL-33. Danger associated molecular patterns, DAMPs, are also an example, such as cell-free chromatin and ATP. While pathogenic viruses are likely capable of in interfering with these types of immune surveillance, perhaps it, it is a bit more challenging to commandeer host cells without disturbing healthy biology than it is to mutate an amino acid critical for T or B cell recognition. And if they could do the former, they wouldn't be very good pathogens. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the great science. Adam Savage, not the mythic one. <laughs> asterisk raining in San Francisco. <laughs> ah, cool. Thanks for that message. And again, I should um, say, so Tuivo 5, which Ross pointed out um, for enjoying as well, that was one of my favorites. So we had, I think you had Kartik Chandran here. That's right. Um, at Twiv Studios. Um, and I, and we also had Sarah Sawyer um, joining us from Boulder. Boulder, right. And I agree actually with Ross and Adam, in, first of all, in the sense that having the senior authors here mm, yeah. is really the way to go. I like that. So, yeah. yep. <laughs> um, we would have tried to do that um, for today's paper. Most folks are already traveling to the meeting though, so I'm sort yeah. of a um, late goer and so I tried to stand. Well, in. you're here. It's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then on to Adam's point. So yeah, this is a really, I think I agree. So this idea of um, arms races, as we sometimes speak about these genetic conflicts between microbes and hosts as being asymmetric mm. and for there being many different strategies. And I think um, that's certainly what we're seeing in my lab and others who are kind of pursuing these ideas actively 
is that if you can think of a mechanism that might give you somehow a biological advantage uh, that would, uh, mm-hmm. you know, to survive sort of a challenge of a microbe or for a microbe to replicate um, and produce more microbes, it's probably happened. It's certainly, you know, sure. yep. Yeah. And so this idea of not just kind of these tit for tat single amino acid substitutions on either side of a protein protein interface, but instead, you know, the host targeting itself. We actually saw that in today's manuscript, right? right so what do right. O- what does OAS do? It turns on RNA cell. What does RNA cell do? It starts shutting down the cell's ability to make more right. proteins. Exactly. And so then the beautiful thing about this is that the microbes, in order to stop that, that you're kind of the cell is turning on itself with some side effects like autoimmunity in some cases that you have to consider. But it it looks like time and time again, hosts have evolved and tolerated those trade-offs do potentially to the advantage that it will take longer for a virus to work around this. You have to come up with sort of yep. wholesale new, new inhibitors of the process to block the cell from committing suicide in essence. And so, yeah, we think about that a lot, the asymmetry and yeah. mutation rates, the asymmetry and generation times, and then how different evolutionary mechanisms might then kind of bubble up and sort of even out the, the um, genetic conflicts in the end. And, you know, the thing that, and we're just at the beginning of this, it's really fun. I just, this is one of the things I really love pursuing. At the same time, I sleep at night because um, rest assured that we as hosts are still here. And uh, I don't think the microbes are going anywhere either. And so somehow we've kind of um, continued to run to stay in the same place as the Red Queen hypothesis puts it. Yeah. This is your thing, right? This is what you're- Yeah, and Sarah Sawyer's thing- and increasingly Kartik Chandran's thing yeah. and and many other folks. So it's, yep. Yeah, it's really fun. It's a, it feels like a vibrant field. I mean, this is a new field. That's the thing. It's yeah. a new idea that arose not too long ago and which is percolating through, but as people are released from the original labs. And Harmeet and Mike Ammerman at uh, Fred, Hutch, yeah. Fred Hutch were, were catalysts, right? Absolute, yeah. And not right. only them, there's some other groups as well, but that was definitely... Um, one of the big pushes on it. And it's fun actually to, um, I wasn't there, Sarah was, but they just mm. um, met at a, you know, local retreat at a um, resort uh, in Northern Washington near the Canadian border. And I think it was Michael Emmerman said to her, oh, you know, he, cause he actually in, continues to do a lot of internal genetic conflicts. These are things like centromeres competing against each right. other, things called meiotic right. drive. Right. right. And Michael suggested, Oh, you know, I wonder if the same, we should be looking at some of these host <laughs> pathogen things and Harmony's like, Oh yeah, we could do that. And then Sarah kind of jumped in and then it uh, all just sort of catalyzed. Cool. That's yeah. Neat. yeah. That's cool. Yeah. All right, let's do one more. Okay. Sure. Um, let's see. What's the next We're one here? Steve. Steve. Hello, Nelson Vincent. Thank you for a great new podcast. I have a question to which, I've tried to learn the answer, but have been largely unsuccessful to this point. Tuivo seems to be a good platform for this question. Do we think that sexual reproduction has one or multiple beginnings? I ask this because it seems like the ancestors of plants, animals, and fungi all diverged fairly early in our history, perhaps before our common ancestors were fully multicellular. Yet the similarities, especially meiosis, between all sexually reproducing organisms cannot be ignored. Are there enough molecular similarities involved in all sexually reproducing organisms to assume a common beginning for sexual reproduction? Thanks. The last few weeks went from being warm and spring-like here in in the eastern Sierra back to sub-zero mornings and chilly afternoons. I'm looking forward to spring. Best regards, Steve. Good question. What do you think, Vincent? I mean, I'm thinking about, um, well, you know, depending on what organism you look at, yeah. if you look at all the mammals, there's a lot of common features of sexual reproduction. And then in other organisms, they're different, but among those there. So I would I would guess that it probably arose multiple times. Yeah, well, so certainly. So if we go, I think, from yeast, let's just say, to humans to mm-hmm. begin with. Yeah. I mean, so the common thread here is meiosis. and. Um, in fact, you can trace back uh, evolutionary divergence all the way to some of the same mm-hmm. genes that encode the proteins that do the, you know, the orchestrate the process of this um, of meiosis of reductive, um, you know, genetic reduction basically um, for the formation yeah. of the germline. Yeah, that's true. And so that gives you a common ancestor at least to there, um, and then but with some crazy elaborations on the um, 
uh, <laughs> on the process of sex to not be yeah. too uh, weird about it. But, yeah. um, and I think, you know, one of my favorites, I mentioned, might've mentioned this before on Twivo are the ciliates that can have like many mating types. So tetrahymena thermophilo, when I studied in grad school, mm-hmm. has seven mating types. Um, the genetic basis of that was just worked out. And so that's obviously an elaboration. They still do meiosis. Yeah. They do it in yeah. sort of a fancy way. And so that puts us even farther out the genetic tree. However, then, you know, when we talk about viruses and do they, do viruses have sex? What do you, like, what do you, how do you sort of grapple with that idea? Recombination among RNA viruses, for example, because that you could say that that sort of distri- that scrambling or redistribution mm-hmm. sure. of diversity counts as sex in a yeah, reassortment, broad, right? Yeah, exactly. And re- yeah, ex- good point. And, and that bacteria, counts. And bacteria so, have sex too, right? Yeah, like, exactly. And so in those cases, mm. um, that does feel like a multiple origins of sex, but we're now really in order it's to pushing, accommodate yeah, that. Yeah, it's pushing it. Yeah. Maybe we yeah. should ask Bill Clinton what's sex. <laughs> uh oh, we might get that. I think we'll be hearing more about this than we would want to probably in the next several months uh, probably, during yeah. election season. If the, Well, I mean, if you say meiosis is the common feature in sex, then yeah, there was probably one origin, right? Yeah. That makes a lot of sense, but I, was, I wasn't even thinking that far back, but I think you need to. Yeah. Because you can't, I don't think meiosis arose for any other purpose, right? Yeah. 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 Except for uh, reproduction. So yeah. probably you're, that's, that's correct. Yeah. No, that's a good question. There's, I'm sure there are other um, folks who could hmm. maybe, I mean, I'm just, this is off the top of my head. But I love it. I mean, I yeah. think yeah. this is why I'm, I enjoy this podcast because I think about things I don't normally, right? You and me both. And um, I like getting challenged. I really do. Definitely. I think it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. One of the guys I saw yesterday when I was um, visiting Columbia was your colleague, uh, Stuart Firestein. Yep. And I think he really gets at this in some really good ways with his books, Ignorance, and now his new one called Failure. That's right. <laughs> I really love it. I tried to add, I told him about a small talk I gave a week or two ago at Utah, where in that vein, I proposed that another way for it is panic. When I was <laughs> opening my lab, I was really panicked. And yet yeah. we had, I felt like some nice um, insights that really uh, sort of follow in that I think, uh, look at yeah. a, sort of a more yeah. liberal view of how science happens. Yeah. yeah. Well, we have plenty more uh, emails and we'll get to them. So keep sending them in and uh, we'll get to them eventually. We say when we have guests, we don't typically do emails. Yeah, no, that's right. But, um, uh, but we'll we, yeah, and I don't think we can make it too much farther through the mailbag. I've got to get on that subway and out to, uh, yeah. out to Cold Spring Harbor before too long here. All right, let's wrap it up with a pick. Yeah, sounds good. So you, I'll, I'll start first. I already kind of gave it away, previewed it. So, <laughs> There's a cool um, TED Talk from a few years ago by Svante Pabo, who will be speaking tonight at the Biology of Genomes meeting and updating us on a lot of these, what he calls DNA clues from our inner inner Neanderthal. And we covered some of those a little bit um, here today. And this video, which is about 15 minutes, I think, um, gives a really nice background onto sort of how we think about, like how that was first. So as um, he and others started sequencing these archaic uh, human samples from bone or getting DNA from the bone, how they took the um, genomic annotations and then inferred these ideas of the intergressions and the haplotypes. He really explains it in, in a great way. Um, the first few minutes are kind of really go to the beginning and just thinking about um, you know DNA and mutations and how to think of it. So it really starts at the beginning in that sense and about midway through um, switches to our human history as it relates to these guys. So I would say check that out if you want something a little more smooth than you might have heard from uh, uh, our ramblings here today. I will definitely. Uh, I never met uh, Svante, but a number of years ago I was involved in a in a story where, I don't know if you remember, there was a book called The River which suggested that uh, HIV originated in the 50s mm. in a polio vaccine trial, yeah. which we know... Is, is wrong because the the dating of the origin puts it more like uh, the early 1900s. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was blamed on a particular vaccine produced by Hilary Kaprowski at the Wistar Institute. Yeah. So um, I was contacted by the Wistar. They had some samples of the vaccine left, and they wanted to see if it was produced in chimps or in other kinds of monkeys. That was a key part of the idea that if it were produced in chimp, chimp cells, then it may have been contaminated with SIV or something. Wow, yeah, yeah. So well, my job was to get the samples and split them up and code them, and then they sent them to Svante, ah. among others, when he did the mitochondrial typing to tell if it was chimp or rhesus or something, because he, at the time he was very good at doing oh, yeah. it, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they sent it to, to other labs. And nobody found any other, no one found any SIV in it, 
and it was not chimp at all. Huh. But uh, it was interesting. And then he published a paper on that. He got yeah. a science paper out of it. Uh, not too shabby. <laughs> and there actually, there's a great, uh, well, I don't know, great, but an interesting, unexpected connection with um, one of the guys we've been talking about, one of the um, originators of the Red Queen hypothesis is Bill Hamilton. In his later years, he became very enamored with that hypothesis for that vaccine source of HIV. Unfortunately, I think he was on the wrong side of, um, was. of the was. evidence in that case. Yeah. He died of malaria or something like that. He did on he? a quest, in in fact, yeah. to try to get at a little yeah, bit of that hypothesis, that. unfortunately. That, yeah, That was too yeah, bad. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, the, the president of the Wistar met me to give me these samples. Yeah, wow. We met halfway on the New Jersey Turnpike in a <laughs> Dunkin' Donuts parking lot, and he handed me this white styrofoam box, and he said, if, if anyone looks at us, they're going to think we're swapping drugs here. <laughs> and then I came, I brought it here, and then I split them and coded them, and a week later I brought them back to wow. <laughs> the same thing. That's funny. Well, my pick is a little funny. It's not sciencey at all, mm, but good. I think you might find it useful. It's called a blockhead. <laughs> A blockhead. <laughs> it's made by a company called 10, 10 One Design. It's a little AC adapter you put on your Apple charger, so you can put it flat against the wall instead of sticking out. Oh, I see. Wow. I'm, so yeah. you know, the if you have a laptop, you have that big rectangular blocky. Oh yeah. And when you plug it in the wall, it usually sticks out. I know what you mean. And sometimes the weight pulls it out. And I found, especially in Europe, when you put an adapter on it, it yeah. tends to fall off. Yeah, yeah. So this is a little blue thing that you slide into the adapter. Uh, the charger and it lets you just plug it flat into the wall. Oh yeah, right. so it's like a ninety degree shift yeah, it in order for it to. Yep. Oh, Isn't that cool? Yeah, that's clever. I just think this is really neat, and it's you know twenty bucks each, and, <laughs> and I got a couple of them, and bingo, there you go. There it is. I think <laughs> we need to contact the Blockhead folks as maybe um, potential sponsors of Twivo, given our. Uh... We should sponsor us. Yeah, <laughs> that's absolutely right. Because I bet we could get a lot of people to uh, to uh, buy these anyway. Uh, cool. That'll do it for Twivo number eight. You can find it at iTunes microbe.tv slash Twivo. It's also on Google Play Music. And you should uh, send your questions and comments to Twivo at microbe.tv. Nels Eldy is at cellvolution.org and he's also on Twitter, L Early Bird. Hey, Nels, great to have you here. Hey, Vincent, this is super fun. Great to be here at uh, Twiv Studios for the first time. I like having people. In the room, especially we're sitting here with these mics, you can almost imagine you're in a radio studio, right? I guess yeah. that's what we do. It's just well, and to be in person, out. it's a little more of a real conversation. Yeah, all the way from the Western Rockies yeah. out to here, but well, that's we'll, not too bad either. We will do it again in uh, when I come visit you. Can't wait. And if you're ever back here in this way, which someday you'll come back, I'm sure. Oh yeah, you have to stop by. It would be cool if this turned out to be the place to come to do a podcast, right? Yeah, yeah, a science podcast, anyway. Yeah, kind of like a, <laughs> like one of the old New York jazz clubs. That's right. Yeah. Stop by the Twiv Studios and uh, do a podcast with with Vinny. Cool. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music you hear on Twivo is performed by Trampled by Turtles. You can find their work at trampledbyturtles.com. We've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Till then, be curious. <laughs>